よ、む。やりん。え、ちめ、やら、やるです。え、そう、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、で、
But, well, here's a quote from Isaac Hempstead Wright, who plays Bran. We actually did a scene that clearly got cut, a short scene with Sansa where she knocks on Bran's door and says, I need your help, or something along those lines. So basically, as far as I know, the story was that it suddenly occurred to Sansa that she had a huge CCTV department at her discretion and it might be a good idea to check with him first before she guts her own sister. So she goes to Bran and Bran tells her everything she needs to know and she's like, oh sh. And oh, Sansa, you have been done dirty. I know that after the shit show that was season five, some Sansa stands are happy that at least one of the women got to be in charge without having to be put down like old Yeller. But if we may for a moment be honest with ourselves, her entire character has been one massive train wreck ever since season five when Littlefinger's like, hey, Marry the son of the guy who murdered your entire family. And she's like, no, okay. Then it's the fast track to rape town, escape, and then season seven, she completes her evolution into Ladyfinger, stripped of all pathos, because to D&D, female empowerment is shedding your humanity until you are a stone cold badass. But you know, the kind who only does some hideously inhumane executions. <laughs> Feminism. To be clear, I am not on the Sansa hate train. I just think they popped a squad over her character arc just like they did everyone else. By season eight, everyone's gushing over how smart Sansa is. She's evolved into her final form, but unlike in earlier seasons where her intelligence would come out through these moments of her being more quick thinking than people expected. Did you say I can't? I only meant it would be bad luck to kill a man on your main day. Or by her playing into her enemy's arrogance. So you'll be outside the gates fighting in the vanguard. A king doesn't discuss battle plans with stupid girls. I'm sorry, Your Grace, you're right, I'm stupid. Of course you'll be in the vanguard. They say my brother Rob always goes where the fighting is thickest, and he's only a pretender. She now gets these cool girl badass moments that build not at all on the lessons she learned in King's Landing, but instead on violence and a need to humiliate her enemies. One of Sansa's earlier defining attributes was her compassion, that she cared about people despite the pain she was put through. In the books, she never loses that sense of compassion, but gets smarter about figuring out who is worthy of it, and who is playing her for their own advantage. Here in the show, that warmth is totally extinguished. Sansa's compassion and appeals to goodness are framed not as a strength, but as immature weakness that she needs to outgrow. Oh, stupid. Stupid little girl with stupid dreams who never learn. New empowerment Sansa doesn't act like someone who would take pity on a drunk knight, risking Joffrey's wrath, or someone who would have any ounce of empathy for someone like the Hound like she did in season two. Sansa in the Crypts doesn't bother trying to calm the other women and children like she did during the Siege of King's Landing in season two. New empowerment Sansa spends the whole battle trash talking Daenerys. It wouldn't work between us. Why not? The Dragon Queen. Who, unlike Sansa, is out there risking her life. Without the Dragon Queen, there'd be no problem at all. We'd all be dead already. Season 8 keeps telling us what Sansa is. She's the smartest person I've ever met. That she's smart, that she's shrewd, but nothing in her actions support that. Earlier, Sansa would know to keep her mouth shut about someone she was suspicious of. Meanwhile, new empowerment Sansa won't shut the f*** up about how much she doesn't like Daenerys. Why her? During Sansa's entire King's Landing storyline, she keeps herself alive by feigning loyalty to Joffrey and Cersei. What are you praying for? For the gods to have mercy on us all. Even me. Of course, Your Grace. Even if she did plan on undermining Daenerys, I guess D&D kind of oh, forgot, forgot that one of Sansa's most important lessons is when to feign respect and fidelity. What do dragons eat, anyway? Whatever they want. Sansa's evolution mirrors the Starks as a whole. The compassion and nobility that define the Starks is one of their biggest assets. But in the end, they're no better than the f***ing Lannisters. Fuck prophecy. Fuck fate. Fuck everyone who isn't us. We don't trust your queen. You don't know her yet. I'll never know her. She's not one of us. Change their house motto from winter is coming to f*** you got mine. Because that's female empowerment to these showrunners. I'm glad I got raped, actually, Mr. The Hound. It made me a cool girl badass. Without Littlefinger and Ramsay and the rest, I would have stayed a little bird all my life. I'm a bitch, I'm a so Sansa is a northern separatist now for some f***ing reason, even though now is not the time. They remember what happened the last time Targaryens brought dragons north. Yeah, nothing. Nothing happened. When Aegon the Conqueror invaded, the North bent the knee immediately and joined the Seven Kingdoms without a fight and nobody died. The countryside was not burninated. The king at the time was called the king who knelt for a reason. 
I guess someone kind of forgot. forgot. They remember what happened the last time Targaryens brought dragons north. One season earlier. But I could have sworn I read the last king in the north was Torrin Stark, who bent the knee to my ancestor Aegon Targaryen. There are cases to be made for an independent north doing well in the past, but this whole situation in Winterfell we have written for season 8, it, uh, it actually makes a pretty good case for United Seven Kingdoms. We needed her army. Her dragons. Yep, you sure did. How are we meant to feed the greatest army the world has ever seen? Good thing we've got the Reach, a part of the Seven Kingdoms, which also happens to support Daenerys' claim. And it wasn't even that they had it unlocked before Daenerys showed up with all these mouths to feed. You're telling me we don't have enough food, especially not if the armies of the North come back to defend Winterfell. How are we going to feed our own people was a problem at the beginning of the season that is set up and promptly ignored. What do dragons eat, anyway? You know what, Sansa? It doesn't matter. Don't worry your empowered little head about it. Enjoy those dragons and supplies from other regions now that it's f***ing winter and you all have a common enemy. You seem determined to dislike her. Like, they did Daenerys dirty, and we'll get to Daenerys, but what they did to Sansa is just depressing. Sansa's only purpose this season is to have an unfounded suspicion of Daenerys, which only proves to be founded when Daenerys does something completely nonsensical. Otherwise, Daenerys has essentially given all of her resources to defend Winterfell, based on the promise of the guy in charge. And Sansa is still like, hmm, I don't know. I don't like the cut of her jib. Why her? By the end of the stupid, dumb Battle of Winterfell, Daenerys has proved herself worthy of being a queen about as well as one can expect in this universe. She's forging alliances, doing battle, keeping her promises to her followers and to her allies. So Sansa's stink eye over Daenerys makes no sense. She never even lived through the Targaryens hurting her family. The operative word, mad king, burned her grandfather and uncle to death. But she sure did Cersei. You know, their common enemy whose family wiped her own out. Sansa's mistrust of Daenerys only makes sense if you're writing from the end forward, telling us she is smart when her intelligence is really just writer clairvoyance. Giving Sansa suspicions without giving her any reason to have them, other than the writers know how the show will end and they want Sansa to look smart. It's the Dragon Queen. It's quite beautiful. What does that have to do with anything? Or maybe, I don't know, Sansa is jealous because Daenerys is pretty. Which surely they would never... Oh, come on! <sighs> anyway, moving on. Ron is a fan favorite. Rick on. Dick on. <laughs> but by season eight, hell, by season five, he has nothing to do and no reason to be here. But people like him, so here he is. It seems like they were planning a different ending for Bronn, like one that had some character development. In season seven, during the loot train attack, Bronn loses his gold in a very symbolic moment. He then leaves it to risk his life in a big way to save Jaime, with no mercenary reason for doing so. Is this a sign of character development? Is Bronn changing his ways? Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Nope, and guess who gets the worst subplot of all time? You do, you do. You boys are a pair of gold-plated cons. So Cersei asks Bronn to go murder her brothers, as you do. What will she do for the manor ritzer of her treasonous brothers? Bronn fast travels to Winterfell and holds them at Arrow Point and tells them he thinks their side will win because dragons, so he blackmails Jaime and Tyrion into giving him... Highgarden, you could be Lord of the Reach. Highgarden, are you mad? It's better than being dead. Okay, so for those of you playing the home game, Highgarden is the capital of the Reach, seat of the now extinct House Tyrell, and the breadbasket of the Seven Kingdoms, and the most populous. Yes, there are probably still many Tyrells next in line to claim the Reach, to say nothing of the other great houses in the Reach with a much better claim to the seat. But yeah, we're gonna install Sir No Name as Lord of Highgarden because of blackmail under a queen that was only queen for five minutes. And yeah, that's going to go over well with all these other lesser houses in the Reach. Highgarden. But okay, we do not see Bronn again until the finale, where not only is he now the master of coin. I've never borrowed money before. I'm not clear on the rules. But Tyrion has apparently made good on that whole promise made at gunpoint thing. Sir Bronn of the Blackwater, Lord of High God, and Lord Paramount of the Reach, and Master of Coin. He should have ridden off into that good night like Dario Naharis, but okay. Here he is still, cool, 
And in a season that has turned pretty much all of its characters into stupid dum-dums who can't read a situation for shit because the plot needs them to be stupid, there's one character whose tactical nosedive probably hurts the most. One character who was arguably done dirtier than Daenerys this season, it's Lord Varys. Have you considered the best ruler might be someone who doesn't want to rule? Varys, the master of whispers, becomes the master of loud treasonous conversations. The greater the risk, the greater the reward. Go on. Like Bronn, Varys is a fan favorite, but the showrunners clearly had no idea what to do with him after season four because his character starts wildly deviating from his path in the books. You know what it's like to stuff your shit through one of those air holes? No. I only know what it's like to pick up your shit and throw it overboard. I guess in his case they'd figured they'd ride around this later, and they did so by making the smartest guy in the realm a total dum-dum. Varys in the books wants to instill a guy on the throne who may or may not, and probably is not, be the lost son of Rhaegar Targaryen, aka Aegon Targaryen, aka the next in line to the throne if we have a Targaryen restoration. Fans call him Phaegon. In the show, we don't have Fagon, but Varys needs something to do, so at the beginning of season five, he and Tyrion cross the Narrow Sea with the express intent to support Daenerys now, even though Varys totally tried to have her assassinated in season one. You sent word to Essos to murder Daenerys Targaryen. Your Grace, I did what had to be done. Apparently, she's willing to move past that. And I swear this, if you ever betray me, I'll burn you alive. You know, in a world where executions are routine, this seems like kind of a reasonable threat. He has tried to have her assassinated before, and whoop, here we are one season later, again with the poisoning. She won't eat. We'll try again at supper. But then in season eight, he, um, well, she make a sad face at dinner. They ask you how you are, you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Oh, I guess she does ignore his shitty advice, which has, you know, consistently been shitty ever since they got to Westeros and is in this case, as it turns out, wrong from a tactical perspective. They do win the battle easily and with minimal casualties. And no, they didn't actually need to rest and no, food was never an issue and resources were never an issue, so why bother having those conversations? But then Varys finds out that Jon Snow is the actual Aegon Targaryen. No, it's worse than that. He has the better claim to the throne. He doesn't want the throne. I'm not sure it matters what he wants. And you know what? Tis the season for some treason. But if you let me live, I will serve you well. I will dedicate myself to seeing you on the Iron Throne because I choose you. One season later. She won't eat. We'll try again at supper. And the best rationale they can come up with for Varys wanting to support Jon over Daenerys is the philosophy that the best person to rule is the person who specifically doesn't want to rule. Have you considered the best ruler might be someone who doesn't want to rule? Robert was neither mad nor cruel. He simply had no interest in being king. Well, I mean, I guess John keeps failing upwards, so that tracks. Imagine nominally being for the good of the realm and then immediately reversing your stake the moment you see a young guy whose neighborhood townies love him and be like, wow, yeah, that's some leadership material right there. He's a man, which makes him more appealing to the lords of Westeros. So here's the problem. This only makes sense if you're the audience and you've seen Jon Snow's temperament for the last eight seasons. Varys, on the other hand, has not. Varys has no reason to like or trust Jon Snow, other than he liked and trusted Ned, I guess, who wasn't actually his father anyway. Varys only just met Jon Snow, and in-universe has no reason to think that he's a better, more tempered choice than Daenerys, unless he knows what the audience knows. We, the audience, know about Jon Snow, but from the outside looking in, the narrative is all over the place. Jon Snow's only been in charge of the North for like, a week, and it's kind of been a shit show. You left Winterfell a king and came back a- I'm not sure what you are now. For the first three episodes of the season, she's a war hero with dragons that has sacrificed half her troops and one of those dragons to save humanity. The only thing she does in episode four that's mildly questionable is 
be impatient about wanting to take King's Landing, except she's not wrong about anything. The men we have left are exhausted. They'll fight better if they have time to rest and recuperate. Well, clearly they don't. I promised you I would look you in the eye and speak directly if I ever thought you were making a mistake. Well, maybe your advice shouldn't have been so uniformly bad. Yeah, maybe he was mad that she went against his advice, but that particular advice, again, ended up being wrong. King's Landing was stupid easy to take, because battles are easy now, because we need to wrap this shit up. Go, I defended company. the city last time it was attacked. I know it better than anyone. It will fall tomorrow. Oh, based on what? Those dragons have the fortitude of hummingbirds. Up until now, it seemed pretty evenly matched, but, uh, you know, whatever. So Varys, who has sacrificed all to rally a bunch of power to Daenerys, immediately switches sides the second he discovers that there's a pouty, indecisive male alternative with great hair. But Daenerys has at this point done nothing to make Varys logically want to switch sides. The one time she went against her advisor's advice before this was to save Jon Snow. You know, that guy that Varys wants to betray Daenerys for. And so he starts telling f***ing everyone who Jon Snow is, and in doing so, makes more or less the exact same mistake that Ned Stark did in season one, only way stupider. This is way more reckless and way less motivated than what Ned did in season one. Jon f***ing abdicated. That is a thing you can do. I don't want it. I never have. Hell, Jon Snow knew a guy who did abdicate. You were Aemon Targaryen. I'm a master of the Citadel. Speaking of Jon Snow... Oh, Jon Snow. There's a scene in the second episode of Game of Thrones Season 1 in which Jon Snow asks Ned Stark about his mother, and Ned responds with this restrained, burden emotion. The next time we see each other, we'll talk about your mother. Mm -hmm. I promise. Like this is eventually going to come to something emotionally charged and important. So where do we even start with this? My mom is actually from Napa. I didn't know that. Yeah. I never knew my mother. In many ways, Jon Snow is emblematic of everything wrong with the way this series handled its resolution. A big, emotional, profound setup. His name is Egon Targaryen. You have to protect him. Promise me that. With a flaccid, confusing, and meaningless payoff. And from a plot perspective, most of the major letdowns from all of the momentous setup are pretty much tied in with Jon Snow. The White Walker plot, of which Jon was the key point of view character, R plus L equals J, aka the mystery of Jon's parentage, which kind of indirectly kicked off the plot of the whole show, Jon Snow being brought back from the dead by the Lord of Light, and of course, Jon's love for Daenerys culminating with her, um, murder done in an uncharacteristically dishonorable way. After Jon Snow is resurrected, they keep making this big deal about how he must have been brought back for a reason. The Lord let you come back for a reason. He wants you alive. Why? I don't know. What indeed was the point? Well, considering the f**k all you did during the long night, I'm guessing the Lord brought you back so you could blue ball Daenerys, making her go crazy, and ultimately instill f**king Bran the Broken on the throne. Good job, Lord of Light. The White Walker plot was this existential threat that had been built up for eight seasons, predicated on a historical long night that lasted an actual generation and nearly wiped out humanity. There came a night that lasted a generation. Kings froze to death in their castles, same as the shepherds in their huts. The Night King was Jon's principal antagonist and his main motivation for the run of the show. But not only was the big boss easily stabbed away by a character who had nothing to do with the White Walker plot, but the long night was about as long as a viewing of Titanic with a couple of bathroom breaks thrown in. And instead of nearly wiping out humanity, it wiped out a about one half of one army. What they see is just the end of the Dothraki, essentially. Question mark. Two episodes le- Wait, Lindsay, did you steal my joke again? And we learned that after that's done, it doesn't matter that the world of men was too preoccupied with political squabbles to worry about an endless horde of ice zombies, because all you needed to end the existential threat is the one special knife of no importance. 
This is a recurring problem which ties in with what we were talking about in the last episode, subverting expectations despite the fact that it doesn't work for the story. Arya's training as a faceless man builds not at all to this. It could have been anyone with a strong 10-yard jump, and yeah, the fact that the Night King focuses his wrath on Bran and Jon Snow means that Bran and Jon Snow should have been involved here. Doesn't mean that Jon Snow needed to do the stabbing, but he needed some resolution other than spending the battle screaming at his new archenemy, Zombie Dragon. Tangent, I also saw one idea that it should have been Jamie who kills the Night King, you know, bring that whole Kingslayer thing full circle, you know. That would have been cool and give Jamie a reason for existing, but you know, I don't know, it would also have made sense. John's main motivation is farted out of existence without any of his involvement, and after it's over, the only thing that has materially changed, apart from the bloodletting of a couple of supporting characters, is that Daenerys finds out about John being a Targaryen, which not only has nothing to do with the White Walkers, or the effect they have in this world, it probably would have happened eventually anyway. But with regard to John learning the truth about who he is, he never really reacts to it. You're the true king. Aegon Targaryen, sixth of his name, protector of the realm, all of it. A revelation this momentous, especially to someone like Jon Snow, whose entire identity was wrapped around his bastardness. You're Ned Stark's bastard. Ned Stark's bastard. Ned Stark's bastard. I'm a bastard. Okay, but you don't have to call yourself that, though. Should merit more of a reaction than frowns. There's no moment where he sits down and really parses this, discusses it with anyone. Sansa and Arya in particular don't seem to care about the implication this has for their family history, that the stories they heard about their aunt their whole life were a lie, that their father lied to them, that the rift in their parents' marriage was based on a falsehood, that Ned had remained faithful to Kat but sacrificed his honor and basically his marriage to protect John. No, in the end, John reacts to this news like he's just been served jury duty. Learning that he was not only legitimate, but was loved and wanted from the moment of his birth has no effect on his identity or sense of self-worth and is only addressed in the utilitarian question of birthright and primogeniture, to which he immediately hops to, you are my queen. And not wanting it is his sole motivation for the rest of the show. They keep trying to force this ending to make sense vis-a-vis -vis John's motivation. Love is the death of duty. Because if we had to have this ending, Tyrion is the one who feels responsible for the war crimes here. If we must put the bitch down like Old Yeller, it should have been Tyrion that did it, not Jon Snow. Instead of Tyrion being the little finger to Jon Snow's Lysa Arryn. I love her too. Yuck. By the end, Jon Snow's character has been reduced to a gelatinous mess because he doesn't want anything. He has no motivation after the Night King is gone. This is a problem he has in common with. Tyrion's path from the book diverges around the beginning of Season 5. In the books, Tyrion's departure from Westeros makes it pretty obvious he's on the path to vengeance and drinking himself into an early grave, but around this point in the series, the showrunners decided that it's more important for Tyrion to be an audience avatar, the voice of reason, a nice guy, and here he shall remain until the last agonizing moments of the series. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. And characters being wrong in a story is not bad. Character flaws are a good thing, but Tyrion over the course of these three seasons is so consistently terrible at his job that he should have been, at minimum, fired a while ago. Instead, Tyrion just hatches one bad plan after another, and Daenerys keeps him on for some reason. Let's go invade Casterly Rock, a place with no tactical advantage. Let's not attack King's Landing now, before they can bolster their armies. You're too valuable. It's too great a risk. You're too important. Let's trust Cersei. She's pregnant, which means she's good and trustworthy now. Let's not go rescue Jon Snow. He's not worth it. Let's go hide in the f***ing crypts while an army with the power to raise the dead is attacking us. He's bringing all the dead people back to life, and they put the women and children in a crypt with all the dead people. So, rah. Tyrion. He's smart, but I guess not that smart. If you rewatch season seven, it seems like they're setting up a Tyrion betrays Daenerys twist. Like, actually betrays her, not this piddling squirt of nothing. A betrayal twist would have at least explained why his powers of deduction got pushed out of a window. You're not a monster. Two seasons earlier, my expectations have been subverted. <laughs> Kill me.
I kept waiting for anything Tyrion did this season to make sense, especially with regard to Cersei. You crossed the Narrow Sea with the intent of dethroning your sister. How else did you see this ending? I watched the people of King's Landing rebel against their king when they were hungry, and that was before winter began. Give them the opportunity, and they will cast Cersei aside. Yes, a short but violent siege is bad. Mass starvation is much better. And Tyrion, why are you so horrified with the prospect of killing innocent or honorable people all of a sudden? There's our brave men knocking at our door. Let's go kill them! It's only because Dragon Lady bad that Tyrion has a completely out of character concern for the innocence of King's Landing. I saved this city and all your worthless lives and the opposing side, and this pity party for Cersei where he keeps trying to save her life, even though it makes no sense for Tyrion to want to see his sister anything but dead. The reign is over, but that doesn't mean your life has to end. Why? Why, 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 why? Why do you care? Tyrion, you've given her like 200 chances to surrender, who cares that she's pregnant? Which she has been for approximately two years and has not yet started to show. <laughs> Weird that. Tyrion was likely originally intended to be a corrupting influence on Daenerys and or play up both his and her vindictive tendencies, especially after coming off his wildly successful kill everyone in King's Landing speech. I wish I had enough poison for the whole pack of you. I would gladly give my life to watch you all swallow it. Hence this Red Priestess stink eye here, foreshadowing that ultimately goes nowhere. And I suppose this could have played nicely into the theme of vengeance as a self-destructive force, but dang you, Peter Dinklage, you're just so ding dong dang likable. Sacrificing any gray area or moral ambivalence turns Tyrion into the worst thing he can be, boring. And it begs the question, what does Tyrion even want? Why do you want Cersei deposed? Because it kind of seems like maybe you don't. I don't want to destroy our family, I never have. Five seasons earlier? How much of this show has there been? I will hurt you for this. A day will come when you think you're safe and happy and your joy will turn to ashes in your mouth. Never mind the show dropping the Taisha subplot after season one or TV Shay getting murdered or literally anything that would make you stop and have ambivalent feelings about Tyrion. <laughs> Instead, Tyrion remains the ultimate centrist, the voice of reason in a crazy world, and at long hellish last, in the end, comes up with the worst idea ever. And who has a better story than Bran the Broken? Yeah, so let's ignore the nonsense of A, this new system of government they've come up with. I'm not sure I get a vote, but I. B, the person on trial nominating the king and everyone being like, yeah, that's a good idea. From now on, rulers will not be born. They will be chosen on this spot by the lords and ladies of Westeros. This speech is also a thesis of sorts on the nature of narrative. I guess D&D decided that the show needed a thesis and also needed it to be self-congratulatory instead of relevant to the story they wrote. What unites people? Armies, gold, flags, stories. So Tyrion's thesis is about the importance of storytelling and writing and how writers are the most important people alive and please give us an Emmy. I have had nothing to do but think these past few weeks about our bloody history. Boy, I'm sure glad that's over with. Me too. Yeah, but you know, I learned something today. So the show ends with what once was its strongest character, not making decisions that make sense, but instead being carried along by the inertia of the plot. I used to think you were the cleverest man alive. No revenge quest against Cersei, no quest for power of his own, just the voice of common sense who at some point on the boat ride over adopted a pacifist ideology and a 21st century moral code. So since themes are for 8th grade book reports, his character arc fizzles out in a little puff of whatever, but Tyrion is not the worst done by descendant of Lan the Clever in terms of his ending. Oh, Jamie. The heel with a heart of gold. The man who sacrificed his honor to save countless innocents from the madness of King Eris by killing him and forever being saddled with the nickname Kingslayer. You all despise me, Kingslayer. For a principal player, a point of view character, and arguably one of the series protagonists, you sure didn't 
have a point in, in the end. Jamie was instrumental in precipitating the inciting action in the beginning, nearly killed Bran and managed to make his way into most of the major battles in Westeros, but after the beginning he never really made much of a choice that impacted the story. When you break it down, he mostly spent all of his time going back and forth to Cersei doing her bidding. And by season seven, with good reason, it seems like he's at long last finally over Cersei. But one key thing that is left out of the show is part of Maggie the Frog's prophecy, that Cersei will be killed by the Valonqar, which means like, little sibling. Cersei grows up thinking that it's going to be Tyrion, but it is heavily foreshadowed that it's supposed to be Jaime. So I thought maybe this was going to be like a bait and switch, and that's why he was really going back to King's Landing and he was going to kill Cersei, but instead he doesn't even do that much and they both pointlessly get a rock's fall, everyone dies death. So Jaime ends up being like the Nick Carraway of Game of Thrones. Affecting the plot not at all, except for being a prisoner of war slash bargaining chip in the second and third season, and just kind of watching stuff go down, not really doing anything. But here's the thing, Jamie not driving any action doesn't need to be a bad thing. Not every character has to have a utilitarian plot purpose. Some characters have internal journeys, as we saw illustrated by Jamie in season three, and that can make for great television. Many have bemoaned a redemption arc ruined, but I actually agree with Nikolai Coster-Waldo's take on Jamie. I never saw him as a guy who needed redemption as such. The whole Kingslayer thing on the surface was about him being dishonorable, so now he needed to redeem himself because he did this horrible thing when, in fact, killing the king was probably his proudest moment. Jamie didn't need a redemption arc per se. He displayed his bravery and selflessness when he killed the Mad King and was forever dishonored for it. Jamie's story was more about learning to care about people who weren't his immediate family, to grow beyond that Lannister f you got mine attitude. A lion doesn't concern himself with the opinions of a sheep. At some point, Jaime realized that Cersei didn't really love him, but just kind of wanted to possess him, and that she didn't care about the type of person he was. I told you no one walks away from me. Are you going to order him to kill me? If she thought about her brother slaying the Mad King at all, she saw it as a move to protect their family, and not an act to prevent harm to the people of King's Landing. Jaime's arc in Game of Thrones was one of self-discovery, of actualization, not redemption. But there's no motivation behind him abandoning all and returning to Cersei. It's not like he did something selfless and got dishonored again. He did the right thing, showed up at Winterfell, and was more or less accepted despite his transgressions. Pretty much everyone was on the path for giving him a second shot. Brienne gets it in. Hell, even Bran, the child he pushed out of a window, is like, you know, you had to do you, babe. I gotcha. You won't be able to help us in this fight if I let them murder you first. So all this affirmation happens, and then Jamie just kind of leaves. She's hateful. And so am I. A statement which is not supported by any of his actions. Even pushing Bran out of a window was described as... The things I do for love. And that is why his ending is bogus. Not because he had a redemption arc ruined, but because he kind, kind of, of forgot, forgot about, about rediscovering himself when there was nothing going on in the story that would actually make him go back on that. Jamie is not hateful. The revelation in season three is a testament to how he never was. So what the hell is this? She's hateful. And so am I. And then in the penultimate episode, Jamie gets, well, not the worst line, but his worst line. If not for yourself, if not for her, and for every one of the million people in that city, innocent or otherwise. To be honest, I never really cared much for them. Innocent or otherwise. Then why? The fuck? Did you sacrifice everything, your reputation, your honor, your oath, to stabinate the burn man? And I don't want to hear any of these in denial crap. This is, the, this is the end of the show. We ain't got time for that. Jamie's narrative being totally character driven would have been fine if it went anywhere. But like Tyrion, like Jon Snow, Jamie's motivation is driven into fucking nonsense in the service of keeping him sympathetic relative to Dragon Lady Bad. We know what kind of a guy Jamie is based on his actions, so for him to say, She's hateful. And so am I. Without even really giving us a why, only serves as a cheap twist. It's surprising, but not unexpected, isn't it? After all, he's explaining his motivation with words. And if motivations are explained with words, that means they de facto make sense. Telling the audience the thing makes sense with your dialogue, while not supporting the thing with the character's actions, is kind of a trend in the last season of Game of Thrones. 
So Cersei Lannister, one of the greatest villains not just in TV history, but arguably in all of literature. She sure didn't have much to do by the end there, did she? All of Tyrion's stupid mistakes and wildly out of character and unmotivated sudden trust in his evil sister serve the purpose of keeping Cersei in the game. Perhaps you'll remember I chose to help with no promises or assurances from any of you. Which feels even more insulting given that Cersei, close blowing up the Sept, faces no consequences nor has a secret evil plan beyond staring on a balcony and glowering over my domain with a glass of wine. Which, look, I get it, that's my usual Friday night, but, um, that's pretty much all she does in season eight. You know, besides, you know, the thing with Hot Topic Pirate. You might be the most arrogant man I've ever met. And then the show makes Cersei sympathetic, but it's like in the most condescending way possible. I want to be able to live. Don't let me die, Jake. Please don't let me die. Cersei is one of the most horrendous characters committed to film. Yet somehow at the end she's just a girl and she's just scared and and he's there to comfort her. When the plot says so, Cersei's armies instantly crumble and she dies a w weirdly sympathetic death in Jaime's arms, who is here for some reason, in a rocks fall, everyone dies situation that feels more on par with like a C-tier Disney movie, unless in line with someone who once said, Power is power. But more than this, it's important to look at Cersei for who she is presented as a monarch and what the show built her up to be before Daenerys torched King's Landing. Let the monsters kill each other. And while they battle in the north, we take back the lands that belong to us. The big thing here, and I mean big thing, as a defining action in Cersei's rule, is her effectively blowing up the in-universe equivalent of the Vatican as a means to wipe out her enemies and flex on how many fucks she gives, which is... Zero. And yes, the scene was awesome, and yes, it feels like something someone as reckless and vengeful as Cersei would do when pushed to the utter brink. But. But. Prior to season four, most of the plot of Game of Thrones is centered around the direct consequences of one guy, Ned Stark, getting his head lopped off in what pretty much everyone who wasn't the child who ordered it, even Cersei, felt was a massive dick move. Meanwhile, post season six, Cersei not only blew up one of the largest buildings in Westeros and wiped out a decent chunk of the faith and its leader, but also decimated one of the most powerful, wealthy, and well-liked families in Westeros with a lot of loyal bannermen, and apart from a few stray remarks from other characters. But your sister has done things I was incapable of imagining. This major act of mass violence, it just kind of, we just move on. It's, nobody cares. There are no consequences for this. She is crowned and life goes on. The only person opposing her is Dragon Lady, who would have invaded no matter who was on the throne. So let's break this down. Why in God's name would they set up Cersei, finally exacting revenge on the faceless masses that threw literal feces on her during her walk of shame and weeding out religious extremism with impunity, only to conveniently forget the internal logic of much smaller scale political issues like Ned Stark's execution causing massive upheaval. Not to mention, again, wasting someone like Lena Headey's talent. I wanted those elephants. Well, here's why. It's because of how season eight ends. This one act necessitates that, yes, Cersei would be considered an unparalleled, top-tier, Megatron-grade tyrant. She couldn't have wiped out all of the Faith Militant, or even most of them, let alone the countless followers of the Seven in Westeros who would feel understandably very pissed and personally attacked by this maneuver. This is also to say nothing of all the people who saw her as 100% illegitimate or believed that her children were inbred bastards or who would want revenge on her for what she did to house Tyrell. So these dum-dums wrote a juicy situation which in theory could have led to some of the best acting from one of their most talented players, but the problem here is that it would have revealed her as a tyrant leading to a situation where literally anyone with a claim to the throne would be looked upon by the people of King's Landing as a liberator. Which leads us to the person who, at least as far as everyone knows, has the best claim to the throne, and wouldn't you know it, has already defined herself as a liberator. So if Dragon Lady up riding some dragons like, oh hey, hi, I'm here to liberate y'all, I'm the breaker of chains, love me please, it's fair to say that D&D created a situation where, yeah, 
Actually, that sounds pretty great for the small folk of King's Landing and the vast, vast majority of the nobles who already support her and pretty much everyone who isn't the Iron Bank of Bravos to whom the Lannisters owe a lot of money. You can count on the Iron Bank's support. Mm. Uh, as soon as the gold arrives. It's just one of those they wrote a situation where there's no way Cersei would be able to maintain power after her move with the Sept without being a complete totalitarian who stomps out dissent before it even manifests. She created a situation where she'd have no choice, and she is the personality to relish that sort of thing. I killed your eyes, Sparrow. Because it felt good. Like, oh god yes, revenge please, I live for this and I remember the face of every peasant who flung shit at me and I will pull each of their fingernails out myself. And on a related note, like you really expect me to think that like Cersei's gonna like be upset that Daenerys is murdering the, the 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 innocents of King's Landing? After what they did to her, she should be like, well, you go, girl. So the only way to deal with the fallout of Cersei's actions while still barreling full steam ahead to this predetermined ending is to ignore them altogether. The show must maintain that the people of King's Landing and, hell, Greater Westeros are never affected by their monarch and that they don't care. That social trends do not apply to the rabble or the common folk, even though that was a huge chunk of the King's Landing plot for seasons 5 and 6. That yes, the machinations of the powerful do have effect, and that politically savvy nobles like Marjorie Tyrell have sound methods. And this development in later seasons, especially with Cersei, kills me because what set Game of Thrones apart for the first few seasons was how it was so conscious of how said intrigues, be they magical or otherwise, have realistic consequences that affect not only the lives of the major characters, but also the culture of the world itself. Like in season 7 during the loot train attack, Daenerys recklessly burns all that food from the Reach. That surely should have had some consequences, right? Maybe set off a touch of the old starvation? But like the destruction of the Sept, they wrote a situation that should have had consequences, but didn't. So I'm guessing that the existence of Phaegon creates a situation where it makes perfect sense not only for the people of Westeros to reject Daenerys, but for her own sense of entitlement to make her descent into power obsession make sense not only based on the situation, but also based on the character that we know. Unfortunately, that is not the situation that these chuckle f**ks wrote. So let's deal with Daenerys. Daenerys came to power effectively from nothing, not only because of an important name and some dragons, but because people believed in her. Because once in my life before it's over, I want to know what it's like to serve with pride. You believe in her? With all my heart. A lot of people, problematic writing or no, sacrificed a lot because they believed what she believed. What about those who swore allegiance to you? They'll all come to see you for what you are. I hope I deserve it. You do. And then she went and did some war crimes and you didn't even see it coming because she's pretty. Don't you feel stupid. Tyrion, Jorah, Jon Snow, all big dum-dums who fell for her not because she was a charismatic, strong-willed leader who was constantly trying to balance her not inconsiderable power with doing the right thing, but because they wanted to get into them panties. I know you love her. I love her too. Not as successfully as you. <gasps> if your story is purporting to say something, which I assume this is because Drogon is burning the symbolism, it needs to have a basis of knowledge of what it is saying something about. I want to touch on the nature of power since the show is so centered around it. In the end, the show has f all to say about power corrupting. One presumes because the writers did not think too hard about what leads to power corrupting. Here's an anecdote. Back in the late 1930s, a man fresh out of law school was trying his first case when the judge threatened to disbar him. Said the judge, I have serious doubts whether you have the ethical qualifications to practice law. That lawyer's name? Albert Einstein. Just kidding, it was Richard Nixon. And yes, that actually happened. At the time, Nixon admitted to taking questionable actions without his client's authority. Decades later, we would discover that power did not corrupt him, he corrupted power. Being president revealed to the outside world who he was all along. I have always tried to do what was best for the nation. Said author Robert Caro, reflecting on Lyndon B. Johnson, power doesn't always corrupt. 
power always reveals. When you have enough power to do what you always wanted to do, then you see what the guy always wanted to do. Your reign is over. My reign has just begun. And in both the books and the series, we have a pretty good idea of what Daenerys wanted to do because she did it. Dracarys. People point to speeches like this, which, uh... I am Daenerys Stormborn of the blood of Old Valyria, and I will take what is mine. With fire and blood, I will take it. Big speeches like this didn't match her actions. Daenerys had power. We saw what she did with it. Violence? Sure. En masse against peasants? N n n no. Daenerys's entire arc deals with the fact that small folks suffer when lords flex military might and her questioning when violence was worth the cost. The main reason she was doing so badly at the invasion initially was because she was trying to be more humane than Aegon the Conqueror. I am not here to be Queen of the Ashes. So she understandably is like, well, maybe I should just Aegon the motherfucker. Enough with the clever plans. I have three large dragons. I'm going to fly them to the Red Keep. She wasn't just one of the few people with a modicum of power that was concerned with the plights of the lower classes. That was how she defined herself. Breaker of chains, protector of the innocent. I will not let those I have freed slide back into chains. And this is why I think the whole power corrupts thing is bogus where it pertains to Daenerys. She's had power. She's had it for a long time. If power hasn't revealed the real Daenerys by now, when the fuck will it? After she wins her trillionth battle? No, actually, the slaughter of unarmed civilians is not a logical progression. Varys talks about her coin still being in the air, and it's like... They say every time a Targaryen is born, the gods toss a coin, and the world holds its breath. Really, dude? You know what kind of leader she is. She's demonstrated it over and over, and she's been pretty consistent about when she's been punitive, when she's been inhumane to her enemies, and when she's done the right thing. Until this episode, when she reveals that she's actually Super Hitler, the Hitler that flies! And then she sees the Red Keep. It's in that moment on, on the walls of King's Landing when she's looking at that symbol of everything that was taken from her when she makes the decision to, to make this personal. What? what? You, 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 said, you said it was because she wanted to rule through fear. I didn't be fear. You said that in the in the text that you wrote. You you explaining it makes it worse. Now it's a Thirty Rock skit. I'll now take questions. Oh no, my period. Let's no England. I think we all knew there was no way Daenerys was going to end up getting what she wanted. The first time I read about Fagon, my visceral reaction was, oh, oh no, this is going to make Daenerys do something stupid. Problem is, ain't no Fagon in the show. But with regard to the idea that power doesn't corrupt, it reveals, I think you learn what you need to know about the way Daenerys handles power in season one. Khal Drogo is ready to do some pillaging because they need resources to go after that Iron Throne, and Danny is okay with it until she sees the human cost. So she pulls a white savior, saves this woman, and is betrayed by this woman because of course she is. I spoke for you. I saved you. Danny doesn't put two and two together that she is the reason this woman lost everything. So when the woman is insufficiently grateful, she burns her alive and gets three dragons out of it. So that Daenerys turns to darkness because the people of Westeros don't fall over themselves in worship is a perfectly logical progression on paper. Problem is they put her in a position where logically the people of the North should have been grateful. To the Dragon Queen! The people of King's Landing should have been like, hell yes, thank God, literally anyone but Cersei. But then they keep explaining it like it makes sense what happened. But before she breaks, she's sad that the people of the North prefer Jon Snow, a native of the North. And I guess Danny kind, kind of, of forgot, forgot that despite losing the reach with the Tyrells, she still has the support of the North, the Vale, the Iron Islands, Dorne, and presumably Storm's End now that she's legitimized Gendry. But she decides that she'll never be loved because the people of the North prefer their hometown boy to Dragon Lady. Far more people in Westeros love you than love me. I don't have love here. Sure. What they foreshadowed is Daenerys doing awful things when she thought she had a good reason for doing them. Not, you know, no reason. She was ruthless, sure, and she made some bad decisions, but she never surrounded herself with yes-men, the main hallmark of a corrupt leader, instead seeking out dissent from her advisors and actually listening to them, even when they were giving her shit garbage advice. Tyrion. Cersei thinks the army of the dead is nothing but a story, made up by wet nurses to frighten children. What if we prove her wrong? 
But defenders of the show insist that Daenerys was meaningfully different as a ruler from anyone else because the framing said so. See? Tyrion make a sad face. Because suddenly we're concerned with the cost of war. Because fire as a battle strategy is immoral now. I guess. Five seasons? Of How much of this show has happened while I was like putting it off because I meant to read the books? Should I read the books? Leave a comment in the description of Lindsay's video. <laughs> No, Daenerys wasn't always compassionate, but she made rational decisions, negative or positive. You can't have this sort of medieval wartime code that the characters all live by, and then in the last three episodes have everyone suddenly concerned with the cost of war. Especially when there is apparently no material cost, no mass starvation, no uprisings, nothing. Why is Tyrion, who blew up an entire fleet with horrible magic fire, all of a sudden like, but your grace, what about the Geneva Conventions? Now we're treating what Daenerys does in this scene as somehow morally worse than Jon Snow's mass execution, which included a child in season six, or what Ned Stark did to a scared teenager who's running from ice zombies in season one. So that's all noble then, but in season seven, it's foreshadowing some war crimes, I guess, because she used a dragon and not a giant f***ing sword. None of these people wanting to betray her, except arguably Sansa, the separatist who is a separatist for some f***ing reason. What about the North? It's just one of those is rooted in any motivation that is based on what has materially changed during season seven and eight. Only hunches that just kind of appeared one day because the plot needed it to. But here's the thing that was never foreshadowed. Danny being irrational, Danny denying reality. If someone said, here is why, never once did she go, no, that is very clearly X. You buried the lead too deeply. This was just not the character you wrote. In the end, it's not just cynical, it's meaningless. It's one big reason why the ending left people feeling so hollow. It doesn't say anything about the nature of power and the descent into corruption and cruelty, just that some people's genes are a time bomb. Daenerys doesn't have a character progression that ends with her tragic descent into authoritarianism. Her Targaryen genes were dormant for a while, but wouldn't you know, them bells, that red keep, just triggered those genes, and suddenly out of nowhere, Daenerys is denying reality. And then she sees the Red Keep when she makes the decision to make this personal. And I've seen countless reinterpretations of this episode where people try to make it make sense, to make her rampage a little more in character and justified and motivated. D&D might be hacks, but they aren't stupid. They could have easily made her rampage make sense in any dozens of ways, but that was not the point. The point was to make her as monstrous as possible. For one reason only, Tyrion and Jon Snow have to remain sympathetic. Daenerys' murder has to be seen as totally morally justified, even though having a victim of physical and sexual abuse rise to great power only to be lured into a false sense of security and murdered by the man she loves in a moment of physical intimacy. <laughs> she goes on a nonsense rampage, so then she can then soap opera die at the hands of a sympathetic hero by way of the worst of tropes. Save me. I love you. You've gone dark phoenix. You've become too powerful. It's so sad what I have to do to the woman I love, but it has to be done. I love you. It's for your own good, don't you see? I had to do it. Look what you made me do, Daenerys. I had to do it. Look what you made me do. Her actions have to be indescribably monstrous because the narrative has to justify the violence Tyrion and Jon Snow do to her body while keeping these characters sympathetic to the audience. And that's all there is to it. Much attention has been paid to the bad writing in the Emmy-nominated final episode, but to me, this is the ultimate summation of what failed about the ending, arguably the most insulting line in television history. Everywhere she goes, evil men die, and we cheer her for it. They're doing, like, a thing, see? Oh, you liked Daenerys, you supported her, when you should have seen it coming. She's showing all the hallmarks of a fascist, like a red and black color scheme, and Nazi clothes. That's what fascism is, right? When she murdered the slavers of Astapor, I'm sure no one but the slavers complained. After all, they were evil men. When she crucified hundreds of Miranese nobles, who could argue they were evil men? The Dothraki calls she burned alive. They would have done worse to her. Everywhere she goes, evil men die, 
and we cheer her for it. So D and D are invoking Niemöller's "First They Came" poem to equate Daenerys killing slavers and rapists to Nazis persecuting socialists and Jews, and you, the audience, were cheering her on, you enablers, you lovers of blood sport. Tyrion, and by extension the audience, supported Daenerys's slip into fascism because we agreed with her politics, even if the means were kind of iffy. She othered the bad guy, and we cheered her on because we agreed the bad guy was bad. But then she turned her ire on innocence, so really the audience needs to confront what authoritarian they support. Now here's why that's fucking stupid! As we see in First They Came, yes, fascists create an enemy and use it as a rallying point. The OG Nazis started with socialists and communists and worked their way out from there. And the German people were okay with it because, hey, Ends justify the means, and hey, maybe the socialists and the communists and the Jews and the gays and the disabled people are actually the problem. And then they turn around and act all surprised when that ends in genocide some ten years later. But Daenerys isn't scapegoating just anyone as the enemy. How many slaves are there in Yunkai? 200,000, if not more. And we have 200,000 reasons to take the city. The other she uses to justify her authoritarianism isn't a political party or dissidents or an ethnic group, it's the institution of slavery itself. So in the end, her tragic authoritarianism is rooted in the fact that she wants to end all forms of slavery too much. It's not easy to see something that's never been before. She wants to break too many chains. <laughs> the ultimate what if woke but too much. When she crucified hundreds of Miranese nobles, who could argue they were evil men? First she came for the slavers, and I did not speak out because I was not a slaver. Then she came for the slave masters that crucified a bunch of slave children, and I did not speak out. Then she killed a bunch of fucking innocent women and children, so really I'm the idiot, I guess. One, two progression, should have seen that coming. It really makes you think. We live in a society. Everywhere she goes, evil men die, and we cheer her for it. Like, hey assholes, first they came as a poem about Gentile complacency during the f***ing Holocaust. You can't make an argument about Daenerys' methods being cruel or unusual when she's more or less been on the level with every other marginally decent leader in this universe. Sansa feeds her enemy to his own dogs. Jon hangs all of the insurrectionists, including a child, heads on spikes. Wow, it's a thing in this universe. Put their heads on spikes outside the stables as a warning. Arya murdering an entire house and then baking them into pies and then feeding them to their father, but... They weren't easy to carve. Execution by dragon is a bridge too far. It's effectively calling the audience hypocrites when you hold your own damn characters to a weird double standard. Daenerys, who spent more or less the entire series having discussions on her political aims versus the ethics of her means, is the one we really need to look into our hearts and be like, wow, I guess her reacting coldly when her abusive brother does something stupid she knows will get him killed was a warning sign. Even when you look back to season one, when Khal Drogo gives the golden crown to Viserys and her reaction on watching her brother's head melted off, there is something kind of chilling about the way that Danny has responded to the death of her enemies. Wow. We live in a society. It really makes you think. But if we're following the worst case scenario of fascism that ends in genocide, then the worst case scenario for Daenerys is what happens in season four. The indiscriminate crucifixion of her enemies, the wise masters of Meereen, some of whom were complicit in crucifying slave children, some of whom were not. Genocide against the randos of King's Landing for absolutely no reason doesn't follow any meaningful progression of fascism or authoritarianism. So Tyrion, it really makes you think in the audience because they considered her enemies acceptable targets only to be shocked when she slaughters innocents this isn't just insulting, it's meaningless. If you read the script for the final episode, The Iron Throne, which leaked when Emmy voting started, the moment where Tyrion throws down his hand of the queen pin is paired with the script direction, if this is liberation, he doesn't believe in liberation theology. Which is so revealing with regard to the point that these guys were going for. Why did people follow Daenerys? Was it just because she was powerful or because they wanted it in her panties? Or was it because they agreed with her politics? Everywhere she goes, evil men die, and we cheer her for it. Yes, Tyrion, yes. You cheered her on, not just because she had dragons, but because you agreed with her politics. 
Raping and pillaging, bad. Unjust hierarchy, bad. Slavery, bad. And she grows more powerful and more sure that she is good and right. The argument Tyrion is making is that if someone has the power, with enough encouragement and enough self-reassurance, and if they believe in their cause enough, this sort of thing is inevitable, isn't it? The righteousness of your beliefs don't really matter. What matters is the strength of those beliefs, and that's what's dangerous, and that's what you have to watch out for. And that is why good King Bran is good. That is why the best ruler is someone who doesn't really want it. Bran has no politics. Bran believes in nothing. Impartiality and emotionlessness are the qualities of a fine leader, because Dragon Lady believed in herself and building a better world too much. And women are just too emotional to lead, which is why the only good woman leader is the one who's been sapped of her humanity. Believing in a righteous cause turns dangerous if you believe in it too hard. And really, in the year of our Lord 2019, does that add anything of value? See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand that I might touch that cheek. The cultural endurance of any story has much to do with the desire to retell it, despite knowing how it ends. Bear rust and let me die! Ugh. Breaking Bad is not devalued by knowing the ending. The Sopranos is not devalued by knowing the ending. Romeo and Juliet tells you the ending at the beginning of the play. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Making a case not just for this tragedy, but for the endurance of tragic stories in general. Romeo and Juliet, Orpheus and Eurydice. We tell and retell these stories despite knowing how they're going to end. I bring this up because knowing how the show ends are you going to begin to watch it again? What is the legacy of Game of Thrones going to be? Because there are endings that ruin a story in hindsight. I used to watch and rewatch the earlier seasons of this show, but now, knowing how it ends, knowing what they're building towards, knowing how nihilistic and stupid and mean it ends up being, there's just no enjoyment in the journey even anymore. Even in the very long process of making these two episodes, Rewatching old Game of Thrones was just an exercise in frustration because you know now that the buildup that they're going towards has little or no payoff. The enjoyment of experiencing a story should not be ruined by knowing how it ends. I think that after the dust settles and all the hot takes are taken, and I recognize I'm probably at the end of this train, the answer is going to be no. It's not going to be remembered for the journey we all undertook. It's going to be remembered as a thing that was ruined by its ending. One of the greatest examples of that, maybe ever. <sighs> hmm. Well, this is kind of a downer ending. I'll take off the cinnamon totes crunch. So there, there's one thing that I feel has kind of gone underreported, and that is the nature of the backlash. And I feel like there's kind of a false equivalency comparing it to other backlashes in recent memory, like, uh, well, Star Wars. Because in this case, most of the ire kind of remained where it was deserved. In this case, the showrunners who wielded absolute power against the wishes of the author they were adapting, and even the network that was funding them. The nature of the backlash mostly stuck to what was relevant, the writing, the characters, and it didn't spill over into like misogyny and toxicity as it usually does. You didn't see any actors being bullied off of social media. But I point this out because the backlash wasn't completely negative. A lot of people who were disappointed with the way the show ended wanted to make it clear that they really did care about the show and they didn't blame the cast or crew or especially the actors who tend to be the people that bear the brunt of backlash. So there was a Reddit user named L. Alaria who decided to start a fundraiser for Amelia Clark's charity. Since earlier this year, Amelia Clark came out about having two brain aneurysms and nearly dying during the earlier seasons of Game of Thrones. And a bunch of Reddit users, most of whom were in the crowd that was really disappointed with the way the show ended, came together and had a big fundraiser for Amelia Clark's charity, Same You. You're raising money for Same You. I can't believe it. I'm so incredibly, like, moved and blown away and grateful and thank you and thank you and thank you. Because through all of this, people like Amelia Clark and Kit Harrington have an unbelievable pressure on them for a thing they really can't even control. 
I think it's pretty obvious that Amelia Clark was not thrilled with the way things ended. Best season ever! <laughs> So I have a link for the fundraiser in the comments that's still ongoing. And I hope that if we take a lesson from this, it's that uh, if there is negativity and it does become organized in the way that it has, take inspiration from the fact that sometimes that organized anger can be turned to a good thing. Because at the end of the day, you have to love something a lot to be this disappointed. Who let the dogs out? Who let the dogs out? Who let the dogs out? Hold, 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 hold. I'm not a knight. <laughs> You're a talker. <laughs> this needs <means> talkers. <laughs> Makes me thirsty. 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 <laughs> Why does it have to be a king on the Iron Throne? Why can't we be an autonomous collective? You're fooling yourself. We're living in a dictatorship, a self-perpetuating autocracy in which the control of the dragons- Oh, there you go, bringing dragons into it again. Well, that's what it's all about. Why have stories at all? What purpose do they serve? Well, they bring people together, I guess. And Bran's story is better than everyone else's, which would make him a good ruler. <laughs> I'm your king. Well, I didn't vote for you. You don't vote for kings. Well, how'd you become king, then? And who has a better story than Bran the Broken? That is why I'm your king. Listen, strange dwarves sitting in councils telling good stories is no basis for a system of government. Be quiet! You can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some rhapsodic dwarf strung a narrative together. Shut up! I mean, if I went round saying I was an emperor just because I could recount the entire plot of Anna Karenina, they'd put me away. Shut up, will you shut up? Ah, now we see the violence inherent in the system. The term Oscar bait is relatively new, and although the concept has been around for a few decades, it was the 78th Academy Awards in 2006 that indirectly popularized the term outside of film circles into household use. Oscar bait checks off all the boxes. Racial tension. Can I help you with your groceries? Haven't you done enough, Whitey? The 78th Academy Awards became infamous for its Best Picture winner, as it was an exceptionally strong year for thoughtful adult dramas, and as far as the nominees went, there was really only one wrong answer. And the Oscar goes to... Crash! Crash beat Brokeback Mountain, Capote, Good Night and Good Luck, and Munich, despite not winning Best Picture at any other major film awards or even being nominated for Best Picture at the Golden Globes. Several lessons were learned that night. One, that aggressive for your consideration campaigns work, regardless of merit. And two, meditations on the subject of race that place the root of the problems on flawed individuals rather than historical, systemic, and structural injustices will win awards. But if a white person sees two black men walking towards her and she turns and walks in the other direction, she's a racist. I can't look at you without thinking about the five or six more qualified white men who didn't get your job. It's time for you to go. Now, we have seen this play out time and time again since Crash won Best Picture. That said, though Crash beating favorite Brokeback Mountain was controversial at the time, history has only been more unkind to Crash. Yale professor Sun Tzu wrote that Crash imagines racial encounter along the lines of individual experience of hate and forgiveness without exploring questions of structural inequality and public redress. In 2009, writer and cultural critic Tanasi Coates called it the worst movie of the decade, stating, I don't think there's a single human being in Crash. Instead, you have arguments and propaganda violently bumping into each other, impressed with their own quirkiness, and calling it the apotheosis of a kind of unthinking, incurious, nihilistic multiculturalism. Have you noticed? He's talking a lot less black. Sorry, you know, see my Blake light. Ma'am. Osama. Plan the jihad on your own time. And he's not gonna go sell our key to one of his gangbanger friends the moment he is out our door. You thought you saw a white woman blowing a black man that just drove you little cracker ass quick. Don't be fucking signing me. 
And there was a point in time when I would have agreed with that. Then Bright came along. Yeah! Ha ha! Or cop! There's this narrative that's emerged surrounding Netflix's Bright that audiences loved it and critics hated it. It's hard to measure Bright's success against the typical Hollywood release, which measures success with box office returns. Netflix doesn't release metrics, but according to Nielsen, which has recently started recording metrics for streaming services, Bright got about 22 million eyeballs. That is to say, about 11 million people, assuming an average of about two eyeballs per person, during the first three days of its release. Assuming every person who watched Bright at home would have paid money to see it in theaters, that would put it roughly on track with Transformers 4 and just behind Thor Ragnarok. Very respectable, especially for a non-franchise film, but this again assumes that everyone who watched Bright in those three days in the comfort of their own homes would have gone outside into the world and watched it in theaters. A mighty big jump. The sub-narrative to this is the conspiracy narrative, which is stupid but has become part of the discussion and must therefore be addressed. That big Hollywood is paying off critics to pan Bright because the new model Bright represents is a huge threat to their revenue. Which, you know, it kind of is, but you all have got to stop with the conspiracy theories around critics being paid off because the Hollywood Illuminati are trying to crush your movie. There is plenty to dislike about Bright. Fairy lives don't matter today. It is true that despite the critical reception, Bright could possibly represent a paradigm shift in filmmaking, away from the focused theatrical experience and towards streaming, all while not needing to sacrifice big names or budgets. Netflix took a lot of risks with Bright, and even if this project wasn't the greatest triumph, it will be interesting to see where they take other projects in the future. Although I do question their decision not to hire a screenwriter for Bright, and to go ahead with the project completely screenwriterless. I don't know. They already ordered a sequel from Trigger Warning Entertainment. Maybe this time they'll hire a screenwriter. Oh, shit, did I forget to endorse this? Anyway, if this is your trash, I'm not trying to judge. I have seen Showgirls dozens of times, and I just released a video defending Twilight. That said, even though this movie kind of came and went and everyone else has already, you know, forgotten about it, I cannot stop thinking about Bright. So uh, we're gonna make a thing out of it. That's right. We're making a thing. Fairy lives don't matter today. So, to start, I am going to simply, factually, recount the events of the film without commentary, questions, or asides. All right? All right. Credits roll with a variety of shots of an alternate reality Los Angeles, mostly consisting of orc graffiti mentioning a dark lord and orc antipathy towards the police. The story proper opens with street cop Ward, played by Will Smith, getting shot by an orc robbing a bodega while his partner Jacoby, also an orc, buys him a burrito. Cut to some time later, Ward has recovered, his wife tells him that there is a fairy in the bird feeder, she wants him to kill it. He goes outside, criticizes his neighbors for playing into gangsta stereotypes, says this, Fairy lives don't matter today. And crushes the fairy to death with a broom. Upstairs, Ward explains to his daughter that racism is bad. All of the races are, are different, okay? And, and just because they're different doesn't mean anybody's smarter. Jacoby shows up to offer Ward a ride to work, embarrassing Ward in front of his neighbors. On the way to work, Ward continues to be a jerk to Jacoby, blaming him for getting shot, and Jacoby suggests that the root of Ward's racism against him is that he isn't getting laid. They drive through an elf district, Ward complains some more, nothing happens, and then they continue to work. In the locker room, Ward's co-workers all make bigoted remarks about Jacoby and justify their bigotry by the fact that the orcs had sided with the Dark Lord 2,000 years ago. Man, you know what they say, once with the Dark Lord, always with the Dark Lord. During assignment, Ward is assigned to partner with Jacoby. He complains to Margaret Cho, who blames the York Diversity Department. Jacoby has a kick-me sign on his back, his co-workers laugh at him. While on the beat, Ward yells at Jacoby over nothing. They get a call because of a crazy sword-willing dirty man who mentions a Dark Lord returning. They joke with Sheriff's Deputy Rodriguez about their shared struggles with racism. Hey, don't look at me, man. Mexicans still get shit for the fucking Alamo. They take in the Dirty Man. Dirty Man tells Jacoby and Orkish that Ward is special. Back at the station, Internal Affairs goads Ward into forcing Jacoby to admit that he had intentionally let the perp go because they're both orcs. The Magic Task Force, aka the Magic Feds, show up and reveal that the Dirty Man is in a group called Shield of Light. They talk about a group of renegade elves called the Inferni, who need three magic wands in order to resurrect the Dark Lord. He explains that most brights are elves, but humans can be brights too, if only one in a million. There are human brights. One in a million. Ward and Jacoby get called to a shootout where they find a bunch of supernatural death, this, and a fragile kick-ass waif named Tika with a magic wand who appears not to speak English. 
Reinforcements show up, put the magic wand in a bag, and tell Ward that he needs to go outside now and murder Jacoby, or the corrupt cops will kill both of them. Ward goes outside, accuses Jacoby of letting the orc perp go, and Jacoby admits that he did let the perp go, but only because he realizes he'd chased down the wrong kid after losing the real shooter in the crowd. Inside the house, the corrupt cops decide to kill Ward, Jacoby, and Tika no matter what Ward does. They go outside, tell Ward it's time, it's time, and Ward turns around and murders all four of them. Another group of gangsters show up, led by a guy named Poison, declare that the wand belongs to the barrio. To the barrio. They escape, run into an invisible wall, have a terrible slow-mo car crash, which they then walk away from with no apparent injuries. Inferni leader Layla arrives with her Inferni at the original scene. They murder an entire Spanish-speaking family of witnesses, including a baby, and begin the hunt for Ward, Jacoby, and Tika. Ward and Jacoby Hyde are discovered by Poison's gang. One of them grabs the wand and explodes. <laughs> This is what happens to non-brights who touch magic wands. They escape, hide in a strip club where they are found yet again by Poison's gang. A gunfight is about to commence, but then the Inferni show up and kill everyone while failing to capture Ward and Jacoby. Ward and Jacoby escape, talk about their feelings in a gas station bathroom while Lilo whimpers in the corner. Ward calls Rodriguez, who demands to see the wand. He calls the magic feds, but the Inferni are tapping the phone lines and cut the line with an ax. Rodriguez cuffs them for their own safety, and is then shot and killed by the Inferni. Another fight scene, Ward, Jacoby, and Tika escape yet again only to be captured by a gang of orcs. Take your fat Shrek-looking ass back to your vehicle and drive the fuck home to Fiona! The leader explains that he's angry that they brought guns into that first club they escaped into, demands the wand, beats them, and then stabs Jacoby. He orders his son, Mikey. Mikey. Mikey the Orc, to shoot Jacoby, but then wouldn't you know, it's the kid Jacoby let go and he can't kill him. So his dad shoots Jacoby instead, but Tika rips the wand from her skin, revealing her brightlyhood, and resurrects Jacoby while the Orcs let her. The Orcs kneel and then they are allowed to leave without a word. Ward chastises Tika for not letting them know she is a bright or that she can speak English. She speaks English pretty good now too. Now I trust you. She tells them that the Inferni plan to restore the Dark Lord to power. Using the wand has crippled her, she's dying, and Jacoby, grateful for her saving his life, convinces Ward to take her back to the house where they found her. The Inferni are waiting for them, another fight scene. Jacoby shoots Layla. Ward brings Tika to the pool of healing. Layla somehow survives her shooting, hangs Jacoby. This happens. It's time to come home. <laughs> Jacoby shoots the wand out of Layla's hand, but runs out of ammo. Ward grabs the wand. Surprise, surprise, he is a bright. You're, you're bright. Tika tells him the magic word. The war word is Vaiquaras. And he defeats Layla. Jacoby tries to get them outside the burning house. When he realizes Ward didn't follow him, he goes back into the burning building and rescues him. The orcs that were going to kill them earlier respect him now. <laughs> After all that, Ward says this. Hey, Nick. Yeah. Fuck magic. They explain their side of the story to the magic feds in the hospital. The magic feds take the wand. At the memorial for Rodriguez and the four cops Ward murdered, they see Tika in the crowd. A fairy flies at the camera. The end. So, this is not a Book of Henry situation. This is not a concept so squirrely that only a complete change of genre would have salvaged it. Obviously, there were huge problems with the screenplay, but nothing that a couple of rewrites couldn't have fixed. In the broadest of strokes, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the premise or the story itself. A fantasy setting that resembles our modern universe with the central characters as two cops of different fantasy races that don't like each other, but have to learn to work together when they come into possession of what is effectively a weapon of mass destruction. You could just as easily imagine the two cops as like Legolas and Gimli, and that could make for a fun, unique romp. And it's also not like the elements weren't in place to make it work, specifically with the two mains. Smith and Edgerton actually have great chemistry. Yeah, no holes? Huh? Uh, play the ones that I was born with. How are your holes? The fuck can you make a shootout awkward? Ward is a garden variety jerk who disrespects Jacoby, who happens to be an awkward dork. You gotta be nice to get me right Shut on your first day. But through shared hardship, they learn to value each other. A modern take on a traditional fantasy trope. I well thought I'd die fighting side by side with an elf. What about side by side with a friend? 
This dynamic doesn't live up to its potential because of the poor plotting and character development. Again, why didn't they hire a screenwriter? It's weird. But you can see the intent there in a lot of their interactions. I used to be like you. Thinking save everybody and fix everything. No, I just pretend to be a good dude. The glut of action scenes is a problem because much of these fight scenes with the Inferni don't advance anything. Several times they are in danger, escape, exposit some while Lilu cowers, more danger, they escape, repeat. They gain nothing, lose nothing, and learn nothing for nearly an hour of the film's runtime until Tika saves Jacoby using the wand. This should have been the midpoint of the film, not the end of Act 2 as it is in the final product. And the second half of Act 2 should have been built around these three building a dynamic and learning to trust each other and care about each other, giving us, the audience, the chance to care about her before she starts dying, and about Jacoby and Ward's dynamic. If Tika were to begin trusting Ward and Jacoby during the midpoint, they could have developed a rapport, and rather than her overextending herself with the wand being potentially fatal, a plot point which makes no sense because this doesn't happen to any other wand users, maybe have her be fatally injured in some other way later, and then, the audience having now built up some emotional investment in these characters, Ward and Jacoby spend the third act trying to save her, cue the climax, the end. My point is, it wouldn't have been that hard to bring this up to the level of... okay. A lot of the world building is clumsily explained by characters that have nothing to do with the narrative, like this guy. You ever notice how most brights are elves? And elves run the world? Coincidence? Yeah, we never see him again after this scene. And organic world building that is an exposition word dumped from characters that are relevant to the plot comes at the cost of unnecessarily long action scenes that take up so much of the film's runtime. But this movie is gritty. See, it needs to reflect harsh truths about racism in LA. You know, like Crash did. Look at all that urban gangsta flavor. I thought pork cops. A few hours later, me and Bork not hugging. A major symptom of these structure problems comes in the form of the poor execution of setup and payoff. The trip to Elf Town at the beginning is a setup that never pays off. They go to Elf Town, Elf Town is set up. It is a huge pointed setup. Ain't nothing over here but rich ass elves. Just running the world and shopping. Not only do they never go back to Elf Town again, Elf Town isn't even mentioned. Also, they couldn't find a better name for it than Elf Town. Like, Beverly Hills isn't called Wealth Town. Also, where the fuck is this supposed to be? It looks like downtown LA, but Beverly Hills is like 10 miles away. Never mind. The fact that Ward has a loving family totally undermines the character they're going for. You don't want me as a friend. Yeah? Cause besides taking out the fairy LAPD style, you seem to be doing all right. You have a loving family, you know, a daughter you care for, a wife who makes you coffee with napkins and, you know, you joke around with. I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, all right? Please. I don't fuck with no fairies. You need mm. to fuck with that one. Made doubly confusing by this line. I believe that you're lacking in love, Ward. I'm what? By love, I mean, like, physical love. A relic from an earlier draft of the script where Ward was estranged from his wife. But if they were going to give Ward a nice wife and give them a happy relationship, then they probably should have cut this exchange. And the setup of the family pays off not at all. All it does is undermine the badass loner thing they're trying to go for with Ward. It is a weak incentive for him to maybe betray Jacoby, maybe for a little bit. But really, why does he even have a wife and daughter? They get the family out of danger immediately, and then the family only comes back at the very end. If you want to play up this I'm a bad dude with no friends angle, don't give him a family. These are wasted story elements in a story with already way too much clumsy, inorganic world building. Poison's gang, for instance. They are never mentioned again after the titty bar shootout. We gonna titty bar gunfight die. Which wouldn't be so bad if there had been some growth or development during the previous three shootouts with Poison's gang, but there isn't. What is that, a fucking labradoodle you dipped in ink? All we get is that this is what happens when a non-bright touches a wand, a thing that we already knew, 
and the orcs getting mad at the trio as justification to capture them and shoot Jacoby later, a plot point which is really weak. These three spend a full half hour of the film on the run from Poison's gang, who does not matter and has nothing to do with the plot. And moreover, no one seems to care that even if they get this magic wand, they cannot use it. Perhaps the worst failure of setup and payoff is that Mikey the Orc, the kid whom Jacoby helped escape earlier, that we meet later in the Orc hideout. At first you're like, hey, some setup that was paid off. Jacoby's mercy and good deeds saves him. But then Mikey's dad shoots Jacoby anyway. And Tika has to use the wand to resurrect him. So this setup, the fact that Jacoby showed Mikey mercy, is of no consequence. There is no meaningful outcome to Jacoby showing this kid mercy. He gets shot either way. Bad setup and payoff. And once again, in the earlier draft of the script, Mikey the Orc actually did spare Jacoby. But in the David Ayer rewrite, it was decided that apparently that wasn't dramatic enough. And as in the example with the estranged wife, they kept the setup where the payoff no longer makes sense. I started with the focus on structure because flawed though it is, the story is there and this could have easily been fixed in the screenplay stage. This could have worked. But really, the devil is in the details. Now who you gonna call? Not the MIB. Now who you gonna call? Or COP. A major part of film editing is just as much deciding what to cut out as what to keep in. Elements in a story need narrative utility. Let's examine a scene. Ward kills the fairy. What narrative purpose does this serve? Fairies in this universe appear to be pests, which is fine, but either way, Ward's solution is cruel and inhumane. So from a narrative utility standpoint, either it is trying to demonstrate Ward's antipathy towards fantasy things, or it is setting up Ward as a blood psychopath. Here's why neither of these things work. One, in universe, magic is seen as separate from all things normal. That's magic right there. That's whatever you want. The magic wand is magic, but that doesn't mean that orcs, elves, humans, or fairies are. They just exist in this universe and they share it. Therefore, humans aren't necessarily separate from it. They are just another race in this world, like they are in The Lord of the Rings. So using this as setup as ward magic hater doesn't work because the fairy is just another non-magical element in this universe. Number two, is it setting up ward as a blood psychopath? Well, he's kind of a jerk, but he isn't exceptionally cruel after this scene. He drops his four corrupt colleagues because he correctly assumes they are about to kill both of them. Either way, we never see him abusing his power in relation to relative powerlessness, as it relates to him killing what is in this universe effectively an animal. So he doesn't grow from this, learn to be more kind to the powerless, nor is it foreshadowing some other cruelty. Like imagine if this movie had begun with Ward instead killing like a rat or a raccoon or a cat or something in the same manner. Yikes, we might say. Not a good dude. This must be going somewhere. But it doesn't. That's what I do. And this isn't about Will Smith being mean. It's about nobody acts like a person <laughs> in this movie. The worst offender is the climactic scene in which Ward discovers that he is a bright. Everyone is beaten up pretty badly, and then Layla starts with this. What have you done to my sister? What have you done to her? Which neither sets up anything nor pays off anything or relates to anything that we've learned about the Inferni. And don't start with its setting up extended universe crap. Jacoby breaks free of being hung, shoots the wand out of Layla's hand, and then Ward starts, like, sassing him. Nick, if you were aiming at the wand, that was a really good shot. But shoot her in her head! And nobody is like moving or hiding or trying to defend themselves as they might be doing in a tense shootout. And Jacoby moves to shoot her again, but... I can't. I'm out. He says this like he's got a headache and he just realizes he left his aspirin at home. And all of these characters are within about 10 feet of each other. Nothing is stopping Layla from lunging for the wand with her other not blown off hand or Jacoby from bum rushing her. And it takes like a full minute for Ward to grab that wand and then he gets it and he's like... What do I do? Hey Nick, I got the wand! What, uh, what now? And, and still nobody's moving? Like, they're still in their spots? Like, uh, well, they can't move or that would ruin the blocking. The unkillable Layla doesn't even stand up when Lilu tells Ward the magic word. The war word is Vaiquaros. Dracaris. <laughs> And in the time it takes him to process this, Layla still could have grabbed it from him, but she doesn't. She stays put. Like, you know, we couldn't have set up the magic word before this scene somehow. This scene is just astonishing in how much it doesn't work from every angle, because no one acts like a person who is in danger. 
I'm out. But it's Tika who stands out as the biggest problem character development-wise, as there is never any reason for Ward or Jacoby or the audience to be emotionally invested in her. There is no reason for her to withhold that she speaks English as long as she does. She speaks English pretty good now, too. Now I trust you. Or her brightlyhood, or to follow them around as long as she does if no trust or emotional bond has been built up. By the end of the movie, when she's dying, neither Ward nor Jacoby nor the audience have any reason to care about her. Tika acting like a weird child alien is, yep, you guessed it, a relic from an earlier draft where she was a literal elf child, and that's why they were carting her around. So I guess when they added the titty bar gunfight, we gonna titty bar gunfight die. That means they couldn't have Tika be a literal child anymore. So they aged her up to like a 25 year old, but changed literally nothing else. But Tika is emblematic of the bigger problem with the film as it ties into theme and world building. She's just poorly thought out. She's just as much a MacGuffin as the wand is. When she is deigned the thinnest of backstories, it is pure function. You're gonna need to unfuck this. No motivation, no emotional core, nothing. Her defection from the Inferni is motivated by nothing other than Dark Lord bad, but we never have any idea of who she is, so there's never any reason to care about her. The only character who even consistently comes close to acting like a person with pathos and motivations is Jacoby. Hey, Sophia, what's up, Rockstar? So, like Crash feels like it was written by space aliens trying to understand why humans are racist. You get on your knees and suck my motherfucking dick while you down there. So too it applies to Bright. To paraphrase Ta-Nehisi Coates' comments on Crash, I don't think there is a single human being in Bright. Except for, arguably, the orc. Both Crash and Bright reach to capture a truth, but capture nothing, because it fails utterly to capture the way people talk and think and act, or how systems work within a society. Man, you know what they say, once with the Dark Lord, always with the Dark Lord. Now this normally wouldn't be that noteworthy. It would just be a premise with lots of potential that unfortunately led to a bad movie. But then Bright had to go and make Bright self about race. I said, or saying cops, he said, now we are. Then he went outside into his Audi car. The intellectual grandfather of the type of fantasy shown in Bright is J.R.R. Tolkien, whose works directly influenced all contemporary fantasy from Dungeons and Dragons to Willow to Skyrim to Bright. Lord of the Rings is also a launching point of discussion as it pertains to allegory and racial coding as it applies to works of fantasy. Many over the years have pointed to the Lord of the Rings as an obvious allegory for, for instance, World War II, a claim which Tolkien virulently denied, stating in a preface to a reprint of Fellowship of the Ring, I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations, and always have done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence. Tolkien's attitude was that if people are going to read allegory into his work, Fine, have a party, but not to assume that he intended any to be there. He drew from history, yes, but he wasn't making an intentional statement about it. Now the thing is, Tolkien of course existed in, absorbed, and reproduced the colonialist worldview of his day. No, I don't think he did it on purpose, but I also don't think it occurred to him to question the implications of making the dark-skinned races of men side with Sauron. I'm not saying Tolkien was a bad guy, I'm just saying he was a man of his time and critical race theory didn't really exist yet. However, it is also important to differentiate between allegory, story elements that are meant to have a one-to-one -one correlation with something outside of the story, for instance, Aslan in the Narnia books as Christ allegory, or Animal Farm as allegory for totalitarian communism, and of course there's Mother, which is the rare modern movie that is just oops all allegory. I gave you everything! Allegory is not the same as coding. Why don't you get a haircut with your bitch ass? Which lifts elements from the real world to provide a shorthand message based on the presumed worldview of the audience. I.e. the aliens in Avatar being coded as indigenous as shorthand for them being more pure and in touch with nature. And again, coding is one of those terms that has become politicized and is often read as negative, when in fact it is a neutral term in academia. It describes a sociological phenomenon. Coding is a neutral term. Allegory exists as a statement of authorial intent. Coding may or may not even be a conscious choice. Uh... With stories made by and for humans, there is always coding. There's especially coding in fantasy worlds derived from the worlds of Tolkien. Some that were there in the books. His sense of duty was no less than yours, I deem some that weren't. And on some levels this is kind of inescapable because it's basically impossible to create fantasy races that aren't at least a little bit derived from the author's perception of human cultures. Humans have a natural in-group out-group mentality, and we've divvied ourselves up into lots and lots of groups. So cultural and racial coding sneaks into stories, intentional or not. If we look at Skyrim, for example, we have the Nords, who are a coded Scandinavian mishmash. Formless, the fearless, glad-hearted in battle. 
We also have the race of the Khajiit. Here we have a race of nomadic cat people with these accents. Much snow in Skyrim. Enough snow. I does not want any more. They also make very good thieves. They like their skooma. Yeah, yeah, they're they're Romani. They're they're just they're Romani. They're cat Romani. We get it. You with one of the trade caravans, Khajiit? Your kind always seems to find trouble. And then, of course, there are orcs. Written variations on orcs have been around in English folklore as far back as Beowulf, but it was Tolkien who collated the modern idea of the orc. Tolkien described his orcs as corruptions of the human form, squat, broad, flat-nosed, sallow-skinned, with wide mouths and slant eyes. In fact, degraded and repulsive versions of the, to Europeans, least lovely Mongol types. Nice. The works of Tolkien influenced Dungeons and Dragons, which influenced Warhammer, which influenced World of Warcraft, which influenced the Elder Scrolls games, which influenced Bright. Orcs in all of these absorb coding from ethnic groups from across the world, from ancient Celts to Scots to the Zulu, and of course, the least lovely Mongol types. So while some fantasy fans want to suggest that fantasy races sprung fully formed from the forehead of Zeus with no real-world influences, Bright isn't completely off the mark by applying racial coding to its orcs. And in a perverse way, there is something cogent about Bright putting its orcs in chains and sports jerseys and do-rags, and wearing baseball caps with the name of their gang lovingly embroidered on the front, just like real gangs do. <laughs> According to Tolkien, I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader, and the other in the proposed domination of the author. In other words, for something to be considered allegorical, there needs to be authorial intent. And authors can't really help it if people read into their work something that they did not intend. But coding does not require authorial intent. Coding is often careless or unintentional, born from reappropriating tropes without delving into the history of why they're even there in the first place. Missy called John John Binks. Missy, your humble servant. Coding in Bright is way too on the nose to be ignorant, but it certainly raises questions. Can racial coding in science fiction and fantasy used to make some one-to-one -one allegory about interracial relationships ever actually work? One observation that's kind of flown under the radar is the comparison of Bright to the almost identical 1988 film Alien Nation, which has a very similar premise right down to the first alien cop in the LAPD, played by Mandy Patinkin, and the aliens as thinly veiled allegories for black and Hispanic communities in LA. Why do we have to take them? Why can't they go to Russia or someplace like that? The list of newcomer informants is about as long as a list of Mexican war heroes. Hey, hey, come on. Nobody talks to nobody down there. I mean, half of them don't even speak English. That movie also sucks. But Alien Nation has one crucial difference, as does District 9. The aliens are relative newcomers to this universe, and therefore they don't conflict with the rest of history as we, the audience, knows it. Now, District 9 is controversial because it does some of the things that Bright does, namely using aliens as an allegory for racial injustice. It's also gotten huge pushback for its portrayal of the Nigerian gangsters, and I'm not going to disagree with that. But while District 9 is far from perfect, I'm going to quickly point out where I think it succeeds in its allegory where Bright fails. 1. The aliens are alien, and with the exception of Christopher Johnson, largely incomprehensible. Yes, there is racial coding woven in because there always is, but they aren't wearing do-rags and chains and sports jerseys, god damn it, Bright! 2. Our history and the movie's history diverged like 20 years earlier. The recently divergent histories means that interhuman racism was allowed to develop and thrive and does not feel out of place in this universe the way it does in Bright. 3. You spend a lot of time with Christopher Johnson and see the actual shit he and his family live under and it's not just stupid lip service like a kick me sign at work. 4. District 9 does not pussyfoot around what it thinks is a cute metaphor. It does not place the blame of racism on flawed individuals, but rather on vast systems in which individuals are willingly complicit because because they benefit from those systems. But perhaps the most applicable comparison to Bright is who framed Roger Rabbit. What could have possibly happened to you to turn you into such a sourpuss? You wanna know? I'll tell you. A toon killed my brother. A toon? No. First of all, sometimes it is actually better to just not explain how we got here. Roger Rabbit never explains the history of how Toons came to be, and to be clear, that is a good thing, because we do not need it in this story. It's also a clever reflection on how black entertainers were valued as commodities in the 1940s, in many instances not even allowed to be patrons in some establishments in which they themselves were headliners. Toon Review. 
Strictly humans only, okay? But the most important facet of Who Framed Roger Rabbit is that the plot of the corporate scheme to bulldoze Toontown is perfectly interwoven with both the themes of the Toons as an exploited underclass and with the protagonist's own internal conflict and nascent anti-Toon racism. So when you look at the above examples, especially Roger Rabbit, the laziness of the world building and allegory in Bright comes into sharp focus. Racism is bad, orcs are oppressed, now here's a movie about some cops playing keep away with a magic wand for 90 minutes. Really, a lot of these problems could have been avoided if they hadn't taken a poorly thought out fantasy-based alternate reality of our own world and used it to make a comment on the tragedy of modern racial relations. And the real irony is if you look at earlier drafts of the script, they're not really there. The hacky lines about the Alamo, words like gangbanger and homies, those appear to be air additions. And playing up those elements only makes the movie make less sense. Like the master race of elves here means nothing because the baddies are outliers. It drops this very juicy idea that this is a very vertical society and then does nothing with it, and it ends up meaning nothing to the world. More to the point, the plot itself, keep the magic wand away from Layla, has fuck all to do with the oppression of orcs or Mexicans or whoever. The entire first act sets up this world of oppression, but once the wand comes along, the theme of racism is bad is just window dressing. Yeah, the film still would have had racial coding because all fantasy does, but did the orcs really need to be wearing sports jerseys? Did we need this? I'm, I'm not sure embracing all that urban gangsta flavor and, and leaning in really, really hard into that racial coding while still also keeping the, the racism we have in the real world, like, like between humans, uh, was, was the, right, the right way to go. So you note in the examples that work, like District 9 and Who Framed Roger Rabbit, not only are the actual plots of these movies about the exploitation of this underclass and the direct effects of this systemic oppression, they are actually clever about how oppression manifests in these alternate universes. They have their own in-universe prejudices and stereotypes. Kirak was unblooded, like me, an orc that nobody cared about. He united the nine armies, and they defeated the Dark Lord. Wow, that sounds like kind of a big deal. Like the kind of big deal that, I don't know, might lead to a totally different intervening 2,000 years of history? He was a farmer who changed the world. According to the world of Bright, there was a war of nine races 2,000 years ago, where a Dark Lord was bad, and the orcs supported the Dark Lord. But then there was an unblooded orc named Jirok, who defected from the Dark Lord, united the nine races, and led to his defeat. Regardless of the fact that Jirok was the hero, everyone points to this little bit of ancient history as the reason why orcs are discriminated against in the modern day. You know what they say, once with the Dark Lord, always with the Dark Lord. Let's take a quick look at other fantasy stories that take place in the modern day. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Harry Potter, Underworld, American Gods, Gargoyles. All of these have a secret underworld that exists alongside the world that we know, and therefore does not contradict it. This makes Bright unique, but to its detriment. It never thinks through the implications of building an alternate history. Alternate reality stories are relatively rare compared to secret underworld stories, but they're not impossible to find. Bioshock Infinite and Watchmen are popular alternate reality stories, but both have relatively recent divergent points in history and massively different outcomes. The point I'm making is that the 2,000 years of backstory all of the characters make such a huge deal about would have led to a massively different universe than just LA with orc homies. And when people talk about the squandered potential of Bright, to me this is the worst part. There is no imagination put into the history of the world past the central conceit of a modern setting with orcs and elves in it. And then when Ayer rewrote the project, instead of developing a fully realized world, he had to go ahead and end up with gritty edginess and add all that urban gangsta flavor. So you end up with this. Fairy lives don't matter today. <sighs> So I'm going to ignore how tone-deaf that reference is and just stick with the inherent implication of the line. Either Black Lives Matter exists in the universe, and Ward is referencing it, or this is for the benefit of the audience and means to telegraph that this is a movie about race. Or it's just a bad ad-lib and Ayer didn't think through the implication of keeping it in. Ahem. <clears throat> Here's a list of things that exist in the Bright Universe. The Crips. Let's Crip walk your asses on back to the barbecue. Shrek. To take your fat Shrek-looking ass 
The Alamo. Hey, don't look at me, man. Mexicans still get shit for the fucking Alamo. Los Angeles. Dragons over Los Angeles. Fairy lives don't matter today. Uh... Well, we're gonna go through that point by point. I'm sorry, I had to. Bright made me do it. This fucking movie. Number one, The Crips. Hey. Crip walk your asses on back to the barbecue. The history of the Crips stems from a variety of factors, namely segregationist housing policies leading up to World War II and the FBI systemic eradication of the original Black Panther Party in the late 1960s, leaving a power vacuum in South Central LA and a lot of 17-year-olds with guns. These segregationist housing policies arose not long after Jim Crow forced many black Southerners to immigrate to the West Coast in the early 20th century, which directly results from the diaspora after the Civil War, which was fought over slavery. Ergo, it follows that the Atlantic slave trade existed in the Bright Universe. Number two, Shrek exists. To take your fat Shrek-looking ass back to your vehicle and drive the fuck home to Fiona. Meaning that Jeffrey Katzenberg exists, and the Disney Company exists, and it made its bread and butter from fairy tales, which are just normal tales in this universe, but okay. Meaning that Jeffrey Katzenberg was let go from the Disney Company after 15 years and an acrimonious multi-million dollar settlement in several lawsuits, and after several failed attempts at 2D animation, DreamWorks broke through with its pastiche inversion of fairy tale tropes, Shrek! Somebody. The Alamo exists? Hey, don't look at me, man. Mexicans still get shit for the fucking Alamo. Were there orcs there too? If there's so much strike between non-human races, why is there interhuman racism? Was there chattel slavery of orcs in addition to black people? And that's why orcs seem to all have European white surnames? Was the Alamo a bigger deal in this universe? Because Mexican Americans get shit for a lot of things. Thought you were out having your like zillionth baby. The Alamo is not one of those things. What was the nine races? Were Mexicans one of the nine races? <laughs> I see you. I see you typing those comments about how I'm overthinking this. You know, yeah, it's true, but why are you watching this channel anyway? But, you know, I, I can't, I can't help it. And people say that they're interested in the world building of Bright. And I'm like, it's, but there isn't any. It's just our world with, with some fantasy stuff slapped on top. Los Angeles exists meaning a Franciscan mission settlement was built in the 18th century, meaning the Catholic Church maintained its dominion over Spain, meaning the War of Nine Races, a thing that is so big a deal that in 2,000 years after the fact it warrants graffiti was not such a big deal that Emperor Constantine couldn't make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire in the 4th century AD. <laughs> you cannot include elements from our real world without importing the history that comes with them. I mean, you can, it's just, you know, it's lazy and it sucks. This is why modern sci-fi and fantasy with alternate histories are so rare, and the ones you do see, like The Man in the High Castle and Bioshock Infinite, have relatively recent divergent points in history. Sure, you could give us an alternate fantasy past that resulted in a similar present with cars and stuff, but the histories can't be the same. LA wouldn't exist, Shrek wouldn't exist, the Crips wouldn't exist, it doesn't make sense for there to be racism against Mexicans or black people if, if, if we're so bigoted against orcs. Everywhere I go, live orcs always gotta be the bad guys. And and elves. It just uh, <laughs> So instead of an organic world where the history is woven in, it's just our world with fantasy elements slapped on top, like magnets on a fridge. I know, building an alternate history and weaving it in would have been difficult. So they just didn't bother, and it's just lazy, and it sucks. We will not be listening to no orcish music. The whole root of this entire monstrosity of a video of me complaining about Bright for 45 minutes, which you have now sat through, good for you, thanks for that, uh, is because I could not stop thinking about this one line from Sheriff's Deputy Rodriguez. Hey, don't look at me, man. Mexicans still get shit for the fucking Alamo. No, Rodriguez, they don't. And it's played as a joke. Like we the audience are supposed to get and understand it. Like, yes, ha ha ha, we do give Mexican shit for the Alamo. I personally told my neighbor Jorge to remember it just the other day. But it reveals both the ignorance and the incuriosity of the filmmakers. It understands that movies about racism win awards. And the troops are coming. Jacked up humans with guns looking for an orc who'd shot a cop. You think that kid had a chance? Go, go! They would've fucking dropped him on the spot. But has no curiosity to its causes or its roots. So by reducing bigotry to single, definable, and justifiable historical events, like a lot of the fantasy genre does with its world building, reducing bigotry to single, justifiable, and even understandable conflicts makes racism feel that much more reasonable. Logical, even. Mexicans get shit because of the Alamo. 
Orcs get shit because of the Dark Lord. Racism is bad, but, you know, people have legit reasons for being racist. Like black men consciously playing into stereotypes. And the Alamo. This is a massive shortcoming of movies like Crash and Bright. They seek to understand the logic behind racism, but racism isn't logical. And you can't logic people out of a mindset they did not logic themselves into. Chance the Rapper commented in a tweet after watching Bright, I always feel a little cheated when I see allegorical racism in movies because that racism usually stems from human emotion or tolerance, but not by law or systems the way it is in real life. The world of this movie reaches for edgy and topical, but is just lazy and careless. All it wants is to import the facade of urban gangsta flavor. And the language of bigotry in these movies is so cartoonish that no one would see it in themselves. Dwarks have uh, mad hops. This is a popular go-to when trying to capture the language of casual racism in movies. The focus on historical events. The army of nine races fought shoulder to shoulder to give you the world you neglect. The focus on affirmative action. And what happens if they hire more of them? I can't look at you without thinking about the five or six more qualified white men who didn't get your job. What the fuck about my demeanor gives you the impression that I want to be a target on the department's work diversity radar? Yes, white bitterness about affirmative action and corporate diversity initiatives is certainly a thing, but this captures that bitterness poorly because if you use the actual language of casual racism, you run the risk of offending casual racists, which is a huge demographic. Tonight's hey. the trifecta. Is that your cousin? Full moon, Friday night, no. summer heat wave. That means. So you use the language of cartoon casual racism and never have to run the risk of making the audience question whether they are seeing themselves in the bad guys. How many orcs play pro basketball? None. They're slow, they're heavy. That's why half the NFL defensive lines are orcish. It's not racism, it's physics. Reduce the outcome of racism to a kick me sign and justify racism and bigotry by pointing to historical events where entire ethnic groups made an oopsie daisy. Hey, don't look at me, man. Mexicans still get shit for the fucking Alamo. Fantasy world building is always going to be a reflection of the author's experiences, and you will have blind spots or biases that will manifest themselves in the work. The problem isn't just that this world is too close to our own, so inevitably you can't help but impose our world logic onto it. It isn't just that being on the nose with your race allegory might read as tone deaf. Fairy lives don't matter today. And it isn't just that fairy lives don't matter. Really, it's just that it's incurious and lazy, but it doesn't want to be. And that is what makes it disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. Remember when music sold so well that people would use lead singles to promote movies? Yes, do. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna make this a franchise. Okay. Whoa. We're gonna like have a knockoff animated TV show. It's gonna be on Fox on Saturday mornings. Uh -huh. That's sa Saturday morning cartoons. That's it's still a thing, right? No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs>